Yeah, so um, for those of you who looked at the programme previously, uh, Dr Christine Bailey was going to be presenting here today, but unfortunately she's uh, tested positive for COVID. So she's at home on, on uh, watching this, the live session. Hi, Christine. She's perfectly okay, just uh, couldn't attend the conference. So um, I stepped in to do the presentation. Um, the, the actual title is The Key Role of KYC Compliance in Driving Customer Loyalty, Advocacy and New Business. What we're going to do today is reveal some brand new research into consumers' um, opinions of their KYC and boarding. Brand new research that was only published, well, this is the first reveal of the research. It was finished in August this year by RegTech Associates. So some really fascinating statistics in there. And anybody looking to justify the, the purchase of RegTech will, will love some of the stats in here, which shows some of the business impact of positive experiences. The first few slides I'm going to just talk through fairly quickly because it really reinforces everything that we've heard um, all morning. I've listened to every session. A lot of the themes of the introduction are, have been talked about. So, so fairly quickly, we all know that there's an increasing burden of regulation that's hitting financial institutions, especially since the uh, 2008 financial crisis. Costly fines, uh, the example that was just given that West, which I was going to give, you know, around a 400 million pound fine that was imposed uh, last week. But also it's the reputational damage as well. Not only in the press and the media, but huge amounts of social media buzz going on. And I've got some statistics around that later on about if you're delivered a poor experience, especially around onboarding, how that can translate into poor social media and reviews of your organization. Now, digital transformation um, has been ongoing for, for, for many years, but it's really accelerated because of COVID. Firstly, there, there are independent studies that show that there have been over 1,300 new regulations up until August of last year brought in globally because of COVID. So the increase of regulation um, has accelerated during the COVID crisis. And it's forced a lot of companies to accelerate their digital transformation um, projects, not least of which remote and hybrid working where compliance teams have been distributed. So a real acceleration and focus on trying to automate some of these compliance processes has, has occurred. But we're now starting to see the green shoots of recovery we can see that uh, credit card transactions have, sorry, uh, debit card transactions have increased 43% year on year to 1.7 billion. Credit card transactions are up by 50%. In the latest um, ONS study, it shows that in Q2, UK GDPR was up by 4.8% and we're likely to end the year at around 6.8% GDPR growth. So all this means is you know, more people um, spending, more digital transactions, more uh, cashless payments, a higher volume um, and more uh, transactions and financial products being purchased in the economy. So, so, so that's one pressure on compliance teams. And the other one, of course, is the increased number of regulations that we're all facing. So RegTech to the rescue. How can RegTech really um, help with some of these problems? The first wave of RegTech was really all about um, satisfying the regulatory demands. But then we, we rapidly moved into a scenario where it could really um, help the efficiency and make the lives easier of busy compliance professionals by automating a lot of onboarding and workflows um, in their organizations. But this posed a question for us at Passport in speaking to the RegTech associates, what we really wanted to find out was, is there a true business return on compliance? Does, it, does a seamless boarding experience really translate into business outcomes for financial organizations? So with this, we commissioned uh, the research. The research was a um, very representative sample across the uh, UK. We, we surveyed, or should I say RegTech Associates, 
surveyed 500 cu customers who had purchased a financial product in the last 12 months. Pretty even split across gender, job roles, geographies, um, and age groups. But the, the customers had bought from high street banks, digital mobile banks, challenger banks, and building societies. So the survey really looked at basically what, um, what their feelings were around the onboarding journey. There's a lot of data in this report, which I'll, I'll tell you how you can get hold of the report at the end of the session. But it was broken down into four themes. Number one, what was their awareness of risk? Secondly, what were the experiences that they'd received from their financial institution? How did that shape their perceptions? And what were the business outcomes that um, were impacting the financial institutions after this experience? So it's good news around risk, actually, which was the first one. Um, I don't have a comfort monitor, so I have to keep referring to the slides. Um, three quarters, sorry, two thirds of the people um, perceived that they had a low to negligible personal risk when purchasing a financial product from one of these organizations. People who had a better than expected onboarding experience felt, felt that they had pretty much no or neg negligible risk. So their perceptions were of a lower risk if they had a better boarding experience. The majority don't perceive the banks as having a sig significant risk, and the people who'd experienced a positive boarding experience felt that the bank had no risk, is what the survey showed. And then the third area, three quarters of banks um, Sorry, three quarters of customers believe that the banks do the right thing when they run into a financial problem, such as a fraud or a, or a crime against them. But interestingly, the people who'd had a poor boarding experience felt that the um, bank did little to nothing to help them. So it kind of impacted their feelings about the bank further on in the journey as well. This is a bit of an eye chart, but um, you can have access to the slides and the report afterwards. But what we tried to put on this one slide was the different dimensions of boarding that customers uh, go through and what they felt about each of these stages. So we've color coded them. The ones in green, effectively, we've got two columns. One is the worst than expected, and the second one is the bet customers who are in the better than expected experiences that they had received, if that makes sense. So effectively, ease of following the process and ease of completing checks, most of the banks score pretty well in these two areas. In amber, there was a sort of moderate feeling around time going through checks and keeping you updated. So there is a little bit of room for improvement there. But the area where people were least satisfied uh, was the amount of documentation and the number of steps that they were having to go through during that onboarding experience for buying a new financial product. So our advice really, or, the, or you know, working with RegTech Associates, is to analyze your boarding journeys and look at these steps and try and work out how you think you score and try and move people who have a poor experience into the middle ground or people in the middle ground so that they say they get a better than expected experience. So really, small incremental changes in each of these steps can potentially have quite a big impact on the satisfaction of uh, your, your customers. Now, then we looked at the perceptions that people have. And I'm sure that these attributes, you would love your customers to say these things about you. Trustworthy, understanding, efficient, effective, and recommended. I'm sure we'd all like people to say these things about our organizations. And again, if we look at the data, what it showed was that people who'd had a better than expected boarding experience were in the green, and those that had a worse than expected were in the, uh, the blue. And as you can see, massive difference, massive difference in how they perceive your financial organization. So, the compliance and boarding journeys are really critically important to try and um, 
you know, improve your brand and drive business, which I'll come on to on the final slide, which to me is the money slide, really. And uh, I'm, it was mentioned earlier about one of the challenges that uh, organisations have is trying to justify the investment around compliance tools and software. Well, here's a great slide to put in front of the, uh, the board or your, your FD trying to get funding. The people who had a better than expected uh, experience, 77% were more likely to recommend their provider. Phenomenal amount. 50% were less likely to complain. 60% were likely to buy more products. So, you know, huge cross-sell opportunity there. And then almost half were less likely to switch providers. So pretty compelling statistics from, from the report. And there is a negative side to this as well. Because of the power of social media, as, as we all know, and um, review sites and rating sites, 21% of customers who had a worse than expected experience said they were more likely to post about their experiences on social media. So it can cause a lot of reputational damage to your organizations as well if you're not focusing on this group of customers who are frustrated with your boarding uh, experiences. And there's more to come as well. I think we're not the only people, and yourselves, not the only people worried about customer experience. The FCA, um, I'm, sure, I'm sure a lot of you are, um, from the presentations we've heard today are, are keeping in touch with what the FCA are doing, but they have this new consumer of duty um, rules and regulations that they're working on at the moment, which uh, are expected to come into force next summer. And this is really putting the customer at the heart of... Um, you know, l looking at the customer experiences around avoiding foreseeable harm, enable customers to pursue their financial objectives, and then act in good faith. So in our mind, this really f um, feeds into an equation, which is if you have a poor customer experience in terms of the uh, compliance journey, you're at greater risk of failing to meet the SCA duty of care requirements. And as we've seen from the stats, um, more likely to, to be disapproving, more switching, more complaints, less business, and disengagement. So if you can move those customers into that middle ground, you know, you, you're going to avoid these issues. And conversely, you can work the equation the other way. If you can get customers to move up into that exceeding expectations bucket, you're more likely to, re to meet these new FCA uh, rules and requirements that are coming in. Uh, next year, and more likely to create advocates, loyalty, complaints, more business, and a better engagement with your customers. The other thing we just briefly touched on um, as part of the survey, we were interested to find out these 500 customers' views about digital uh, UK common digital identity. You can see that it's pretty much a lot of people in the middle ground here. Some were cautiously optimistic and some were sceptical. So that equated to about 65%. About 17% were in favour of digital identity and there was a number of who were against or didn't really, well, didn't know or didn't know much about it. So the sort of jury's out a bit. I think it needs quite a lot more education in the industry around digital identity because it has tremendous benefits for both um, organisations such as yourselves and, um, and consumers as well. Um, in terms of um, one of the other things we looked at in terms of digital identity and also biometrics, and um, quite a phenomenal statistic here, um, well, not necessarily the first one, only 21% of people use biometrics in their boarding journeys. But of those who did, 80% said it was great. So there's a real positive customer experience around um, using biometrics as opposed to IDs, passwords, you know, um, and, and other forms of uh, identification. So biometrics, if, if you can introduce that into your boarding journeys, um, the stats show that people do love it. So really trying to wrap up into five key takeaways of the research. 
The first thing is, um, well, obviously familiarise yourself with the research and really try to and acknowledge that um, compliance is a key part of the customer journey. Secondly, maximise the opportunities to try and analyse your version of those dimensions that I showed on that chart and really try and analyse where you're performing well, where you're performing poorly and see if you can move people up the scale to be, uh, for their experiences to be better than they expected. Thirdly, um, to minimise the impact of those negative reviews because people will be talking about you on social media and uh, can cause reputational damage to your organisation. Also, as I, as I pointed out, obviously keep an eye on the consumer duty coming from the FCA, which is going to put more of a focus on customers. And then finally, um, I think the whole community should engage in this debate about digital identity and, uh, because I think it's got tremendous benefits for both organisations and consumers going forward. So the report is, uh, is complete. It's currently being formatted and um, our graphic designer is working his magic on it. So it should be available in the next week or, to, or two um, and we can uh, obviously provide you with a copy of it or you'll be able to download it. Um, what I would say is if you um, want to register for a copy, please come to our, our booth, stand one outside and um, come and have a conversation with us and then uh, we'll enable you to have a copy of the full report. The last thing to say is um, there doesn't have to be a compromise between compliance efficiency and great customer experiences. By deploying the right you know, technology and really analysing that whole customer journey, um, you don't have to compromise between customer experience and complying with all of the regulations. So um, thanks very much for listening. I hope Chris at home, you're feeling okay. And, um, I did your slides justice, and um, thanks very much for listening. I don't know if we have time, do we? Are there any questions at all? The picture of the angry faces. The picture of the angry faces was, was basically me through every KYC process I've been on online. So my question is that. Obviously, all KYC processes are, are not equal, and uh, I think you mentioned that uh, the use of biometrics is obviously gives you a, a very positive uh, response from customers. But there are other differences between what upsets what doesn't, because the results are very general. I.e., generally the processes uh, are favourable, but there must be presumably differences. Yeah, um, let's go back to that uh, that's that slide there. Um, whoop. Yeah, that was you. <laughs> yeah, I think the biggest, um, really just going back to what the, the, the stats we had here, I, I believe there's a bit more uh, um, detail in the report itself, actually. But, um, yeah, I think it's um, this one around the amount, the amount of documentation is, is particularly frustrating for people and the amount of steps they have to go through. I know, um, talking firsthand, I've got... Um, three daughters and uh, one's 19 at university and she was completely snookered recently trying to trying to um, in, in fact it, it wasn't necessarily a, a banking transaction which is trying to get a get get a flat approved and everything where she had no you know identifi identifiable information whatsoever you know no utility bill it's things like that that um, I know desperately can frustrate people um, in providing documentation, which is where I think the um, you know the digital identity comes in and will help. Um, yeah, and the other pain point really was the amount of steps that people have to go through. And I think it was mentioned on the panel earlier about having to do, to tick several boxes to input the same information over and over again that frustrates people. So um, I think we're very much used to immediacy and um, companies like Amazon have, have, have made a massive difference in that area and it's those kind of experiences that have, have, have raised all our expectations as to wanting to buy things immediately online including uh, financial products. So um, yeah this is kind of just a high level summary, there are more 
there is more detail in the report, um, which which uh, you, you can uh, have a look at. Yeah. Yes, can hear you, yeah. Um, question about, you know, I've been in finance for 21 years, you know, I've been working for a big bank and then I've been running my own family office. And my experience is not necessarily through people in whom I give, you know, checks, but in general from, from what I've heard. When someone operates with big money, really big money, they have access to information, how to, how to pass checks, what has to be provided, you know, when there is a fraud case, you know, big money can find right people to create companies, to hide beneficiary of assets, to hide, you know, whatever has to be hidden, political affiliation, etc. Yeah. On the other hand, we have people, you know, for example, who we check, who don't possess that amount of money. Uh, you know, those people probably will be the most honest people when it comes to checks. If they can pass, they will. If they can't, they can't. And if we look at the system in general, and if we look at the amount of fraud in system in general, right, that's a problem that big money can hide itself. Yeah. If you see where, where I'm leading to. Yeah, without sure. Without putting blame on anyone. Yeah, I mean, Thank I, you. Can, I, can, I can, yeah, thanks for the question. I can talk from a, from a passport point of view um, in terms of uh, what we do. So um, the, the, the system, this, the cloud-based um, system that we have really integrates with 25 to 30 of the world's um, leading check providers, um, such as anti-money laundering, you know, ID checks, etc. So um, the system that we've built tries to or en enables customers to either use their own check providers or um, use the ones or, or, or that can be bought through us. And we, we link into up to 25 of these providers, plus we have an API to link into other data checks if you have others that you want us to link into. And then we can automate that into a workflow and then expose that information to your organization or into your back office system. So. Um, we try to build this um, sort of pre-integrated ecosystem of checks to provide the richest amount of checks that, that are possible. But in terms of um, wealthy individuals getting around these systems, it's probably not my necessarily area of total expertise, but I mean, that, that, that's why I'd re reply is that we've tried to build a system that can connect into as many check providers as we possibly can. And, and yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. But thanks for the question. Thank you, Great. Okay. Well, thanks everyone for listening.